Hi, do you know what the password is for the common room? Uh, Mimbulus Mimbletonia? Good. You passed my prefect test. Now move it, midget. Hey there guys, Nordic Warrior here, welcome back to my video game review series. So those of you who have been following my channel recently, will know that I've been reviewing every Harry Potter video game. Last time out we looked at the Goblet of Fire game from 2005. Today we're going to be looking at the sequel and the first Harry Potter game to be released for the seventh generation of consoles. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, released in 2007, developed by EA. This is going to be for the Xbox 360 version. I do also own the PS2 version, which is practically the same game, but is more or less a port of this version with much lower resolution graphics. So after the disaster that was the Goblet of Fire game, EA must have realised, yeah, we messed up big time with that one. As I mentioned in my review, the Goblet of Fire did a complete 180 and threw out the open world roleplaying elements from the previous Harry Potter games, as well as any semblance of fun and originality those games had. Thankfully, after the backlash that game got, EA decided that they really needed to do better and get back on track with the making of these Harry Potter games and making them fun games in their own right and not just generic copy and paste movie license games. The Order of the Phoenix, while not the best Harry Potter game, is certainly a solid entry into the series. How many house elves does it take to feed a dragon? Well, that depends how hungry it is! <laughs> The game is an open-world action-adventure RPG that follows a similar formula to some of the older games in the series. One thing that you can tell right off the bat is that unlike several of the previous Potter games, this one in terms of its visual style and aesthetic seems to be entirely based on the movie, rather than having its own original design. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I do kind of miss the unique and somewhat cartoony visual style of the older games. They just had a certain charm to them. Once again, just like most of the Harry Potter games, the game follows the story of the movie quite loosely. And a lot of the game's cutscenes and in-game dialogue moments are basically shot-for-shot -shot remakes of what was seen in the movie. With a few twists and turns here and there, and a few things added for fan service. Seems like we're always saying goodbye. It won't always be this way. Again, I don't necessarily have a problem with this. It just lacks the overall charm and originality of the older games, but it is what it is. The game begins with Harry and Dudley at the local park, just like in the movie. Don't kill Cedric! Boo-hoo! What are you talking about? They come under attack from Dementors, and you will have to protect Dudley by warding off the Dementors using the Patronus. This then leads to Harry being taken by the Order of the Phoenix, and delivered to Grimmel Place the home of Sirius Black and the current headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix. You get a short tutorial where Sirius shows you how to perform certain spells. You do this by performing several housekeeping tasks, such as cleaning up the kitchen and packing some suitcases. Some tasks that hilariously would be much easier to do without magic in this particular situation. But this serves its purpose to give you an introduction into the game's spellcasting mechanics. Get used to these types of chores by the way, because a sizable majority of this game includes janitorial duties. More on that later. The spell casting in the game is very different to previous games in the series. In previous games, you would either allocate each spell to a particular button, or there would already be a predetermined button to cast them. In this game, however, spells are cast by simply targeting a particular object, and moving the right thumbstick in the correct direction. This I assume is meant to simulate Harry waving his wand the correct way to cast these particular spells. There are plenty of different spells in the game, each of them serving their own function. For example, early in the game you learn Wingardium Leviosa. This can be used to levitate certain items in the environment, and place certain things where you want them to go. This can be quite fun to use, as you can throw things around and even smack them into unsuspecting NPCs. This can be quite unresponsive though, and on occasion the spell will just refuse to work for seemingly no reason, and this will have you spamming the right thumbstick. 
You have the Pulso for simply pushing objects. This has various uses such as interacting with the environment while looking for collectibles, as well as moving obstacles out of your way. You have Accio which does the exact opposite, pulling objects towards you. This can be used to pull bricks off of walls to reveal certain objects and secrets, as well as to move certain objects that are in front of you. You have Reparo which can be used to repair certain broken objects in the environment, such as plant pots, stairs, bridges, ledges, pipes and various other objects found scattered around the game. This can be used to both find certain collectibles and to traverse the game by making a path. Again though, sometimes this can be quite a bit unresponsive. You have Incendio which is used to light certain objects on fire, such as lanterns or braziers. There are loads of these throughout the game and as you pass them you can light them. In addition to these spells you also have several combat spells to unlock throughout the game. These include Stupefy, the standard attack spell, Expelliarmus for disarming, Levicorpus for hanging enemies upside down, this is really fun to do if you get it right, Petrificus Totalis for freezing enemies, Rictusempra for attacking, and Protego for making shields. This is practically the only defensive spell in the game. There isn't actually much combat in the game, but when you do have to fight enemies, these are the spells used. In all honesty though, I found the combat in the game to be a massive disappointment. First of all, the majority of the time spells wouldn't work as they were supposed to, and I just resorted to mashing the right thumbstick like a loon. It's not exactly difficult, it's just very glitchy and unrefined. Very disappointing combat. Speaking of combat however, a large portion of the game's story involves recruiting new members for the DA, aka Dumbledore's army, and training them to fight Death Eaters. Although bizarrely, despite all this training, you don't actually fight any Death Eaters the entire game. Seriously. I mean, you do get a couple of boss battles at the end, but I don't count those because you don't even play as any of the DA members in those instances, and they can be finished very quickly. That's something that's always baffled me about this game. You spend all that time recruiting and training the DA members for combat, and it basically amounts to nothing, but I digress. As far as how you go about recruiting them, near the beginning of the game you are tasked with travelling around the castle, speaking to each potential member of the DA individually, and trying to convince them to join the cause. This will usually involve them having some sort of task or chore for you to complete for them, such as helping them with their homework assignments. Zacharias, Sir Nicholas died in 1492. Yes, that's what I thought. You mean you already knew? or helping them find a certain lost item, or saving them from bullies. Father reckons your aunt's a troublemaker. Someone will teach her a lesson. Leave me alone. Harry! Hermione! Ron! Hey! Harry, please help! Oh, look! They've come to save their little friend! Come on then, Potter! What are you gonna do? Yeah, Crab and Goyle are so hard teaming up on a girl. Very brave. Or even helping them feed certain animals. Some of these are very easy to do, others are a complete pain in the ass and were clearly designed just to pad out the game, which just like the Goblet of Fire is incredibly short. But unlike that game, at least this one has some interesting collectibles and features, more on those later, as well as plenty of reason to explore the castle. As for the students you have to recruit, in addition to the ones from the movie, they also added some from the book that were either not featured in the movie, or were kinda just in the background. For example, in addition to all the popular ones such as Neville, Luna, Cho, Fred and George, and the Patels, you have some more obscure ones such as Colin Creevy, and even the man, the myth, the legend himself, everyone's favourite Hufflepuff asshole, Ernie Macmillan. Keep looking Harry, I've managed to obtain most of the other potion ingredients. Man, I swear Ernie looks high as a kite in this game. I mean, look at his eyes. Oh, and you also have Susan Bones who is, yeah, she's kind of hot in this game. Thanks. You were brilliant. Yeah, CGI Susan Bones, hit me up. I don't mind what we practice. So yeah, there are plenty of characters in the game to speak to and interact with, and they all have some pretty interesting things to say. Once you've recruited enough members for the DA, you will be tasked with training them in combat. This is quite fun to do, and it leads to some pretty funny dialogue here and there. Okay, no, you were terrible, but I know you can do it. I watched you while we were doing the other spells. You did? Yeah. Uh, come on, 
let's teach the spell to the others. Lots of bizarre and quirky dialogue here and there too. Did you hear about the squib who won a million galleons and asked for it all in small change? Yeah, it was completely canucks! <laughs> You also have several side activities to take part in, usually involving lessons for certain teachers, such as Professor Flitwick, Professor McGonagall, and even Professor Snape, who once again, get some of the best lines of dialogue in the entire game. You are an amazement to me, Potter. I didn't think even you could continue such a miserable record of academic failure. They will each have a task for you to perform, and a lesson for you to undertake. These are a fun little distraction, and I don't mind them. It's fun to explore various parts of the castle, speaking to each character, and finding out what they want you to do for the most part. The castle itself is huge this time. This might actually be the biggest game in the entire series, with many different areas of the castle to explore, as well as the grounds and outdoor areas of the game, and even some unique looking locations such as the dungeons and the owlery with some absolutely breathtaking scenery, like the backgrounds and the animations in this game, and its overall graphics and presentation are really nice, and the character models look absolutely beautiful. The game also has quite a few secret areas and locations that you can only get to by climbing. Some areas will be unreachable until you obtain a certain spell. What's great about the game is just how alive Hogwarts feels this time. There are always students wandering around the castle, and you can talk to and interact with just about any of them. Although many of them can be quite mean. You stink. Potter, Plata, Durhead. Pimple Brain. Get lost, Potter. You stink. Seriously, Harry is not very well liked in this game, and many of the students really have it in for him. Is it true? All the things they said about you in a Daily Prophet? No. Hi, Harry. What's it like being mad? Yeah, yeah. Unlike the previous two games in the series, you can't play as Ron or Hermione this time. And for the vast majority of the game, you can only play as Harry. You do get to play as Fred and George very briefly at one point in the game, as well as Sirius and Dumbledore in the finale. But those parts of the game don't last very long. Instead of being playable, Ron and Hermione basically just follow you around the entire game and provide expeditionary dialogue here and there. You can talk to them at any time, and they will usually have something interesting to say, and will even remind you of your current tasks. Other than that though, they don't really provide much of a useful, practical function or reason to be there, besides helping with the odd spell, and if truth be told, mostly they just get in the way. But it is what it is, I don't mind them being there. To make exploring the castle a bit easier, there are several portraits that you can talk to, some of these portraits will be guarding a secret passage that leads to various parts of the castle and act as shortcuts. These passageways help you to traverse the game a bit quicker and do their bit to make the game a bit less repetitive. Before unlocking these shortcuts, you will have to first learn the correct password. This can sometimes be done by either performing tasks or speaking to various students or by asking the other portraits around the castle or even sneaking around and eavesdropping on Slytherins here we are. Password. Slytherins are supreme. Pass, Slytherins. And remember, be nasty to mudbloods. You can use Harry's invisibility cloak for stealth. The game has some level and location variety here and there. For example, at certain points in the game you get to leave the castle, such as visiting Grimmel Place during Christmas, and interacting with several characters there. You can also hear Buckbeak in one of the rooms, but sadly you can't see him. Man, I really want to see Buckbeak. <coughs> you also have the finale in the Department of Mysteries, where you get two boss battles. First you play as Sirius Black, and you briefly take on Lucius Malfoy and Bellatrix Lestrange. Then you play as Dumbledore, and you get a final boss battle against Voldemort. These are quite lame if I'm being honest, and many of the game's combat problems are on full display here. As I mentioned earlier, combat is not one of the game's strong points. You get several short fights against Malfoy and his goons here and there also. I was expecting a level where you and the other DA members take on hordes of Death Eaters, but yeah, this never happens, and that part of the movie is basically just skipped over in a cutscene. Speaking of cutscenes, 
Many of them are basically just shot-for-shot -shot remakes of the scenes from the movie, as I said earlier. At various points in the game, you also get to take part in Harry's legitimacy lessons with Professor Snape. These basically consist of you having to move the right thumbstick in the opposite direction of Snape's wand. You do this several times throughout the game. This prepares you for when you have to do it to Voldemort at the end. It's kind of boring, but at very least it does add a bit of variety to the game. Enough! Your lessons are at an end. I get out. In addition to all this, the game has several bonus features. For example, by exploring the castle, you will come across students who will have several mini-games for you to play, such as gobstones. There are various different types of gobstones here and there, and these games are quite fun to play and quite challenging too. You also have Exploding Snap, which is a card game to play, and you can even play Wizard's Chess against several different students. These are a fun distraction, and once again, they will give you a reason to explore the castle and try to find them. You get a room in the game that you can explore called the Room of Rewards. This room contains several bonus features, and is presented to you by Moaning Myrtle, who kind of acts as your guide in this game. Well, I found something. That's what a discovery is, silly. There are things all over Hogwarts that can be discovered. You should look for them. In order to unlock these features, you must first explore the castle and find certain collectibles. You can obtain these collectibles by performing several janitorial duties, such as mopping and sweeping the floors. Yes, you heard me correctly, this game has you mopping and sweeping the floors, basically doing Filch's job for him. Let me tell you right now, I work as a caretaker in real life, and a sizeable part of my job consists of sweeping and mopping floors, and I don't particularly want to have to do that in a video game. But yeah, I digress. You also light braziers and lamps, repair various ornaments and objects, as well as shape up certain statues. You can also fluff out carpets and curtains and stuff like that. Man, seriously, this game is like my actual job, I'm not kidding. So yeah, if you want to unlock all the bonus features and complete the game 100%, which I did, you basically have to be the Hogwarts janitor. You also have some lessons to undertake from several teachers such as Snape, Flitwick and Sprout to try to achieve an outstanding grade. These sound difficult but once you figure them out they can be done and this contributes towards 100% completion. So if you want all the bonus features you will need to go ahead and do these. Upon completing all these side tasks you will unlock a whole bunch of cool and interesting bonus features. In addition to spells becoming more powerful, you also unlock a whole bunch of trophies that you can view in your rewards room, as well as some production stills from behind the scenes of the movie. You have a whole bunch of concept art for the game, as well as several interviews. I initially uh, auditioned for Harry and, and Ron, um, just because obviously they were, the, they were the main parts at the time, and, uh, and eventually went for Draco. Interviews with both the developers of the game, as well as several of the voice cast, the game has some authenticity with several of the cast of the movie reprising their roles for the game. Features like this are always appreciated by me, and it shows that, at least on some level, the developers had some amount of passion for the game. You should write a book. Translating mad things girls do so boys can understand them. Speaking of voice acting, some of the dialogue in the game is just bizarre. You have Moaning Myrtle stalking you around the whole game and... She's about as creepy and inappropriate as you might expect. You've not visited our secret room for a long time. You should see what's in there. You don't have to bring the others if you don't want to. <laughs> also, Hagrid shows up very briefly and... Yeah, he's as creepy and as terrifying as he always is. Centaurs are good and roiled with me. <sighs> so yeah, that pretty much sums up my overall thoughts on Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. It's a fun game for the most part, but... If truth be told, it's a bit of a mixed bag. For every great attribute the game has, there are some minor annoyances, and some absolutely baffling design choices. It's a great looking game with some fantastic graphics and presentation, beautiful character models, and a great soundtrack, but in many ways the game is more style over substance. Thanks for watching guys, I give The Order of the Phoenix a 6 out of 10. Again, the game is a bit of a mixed bag and, while it does have some strengths and things that it can lay claim to, it just doesn't hold up to some of the older games in the series in my personal opinion. Let me know what you guys think. Stay tuned for my next review where we're going to be looking at the sequel, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, as well as many more retrospective video game reviews. Thanks for watching and God bless. Here. 
Why did the wizard take his housekeeper jogging with him? Because it was good for his health. <laughs>